Vision space requires an entirely different preparatory process to that of central perspective and picture space. From the other presentations that form part of the series, we understand that mind has to mediate the two independent takes on reality. Peripheral vision, which in itself is a totally misleading and loaded label, being a data set constituted from a particular type of noise following decoherence at the retina. An independent system of awareness with its own form of attention, way of perceiving movement, and providing us with spatial proximity cues and orientation cues. Artists have for centuries learned to address the entirety of phenomenal field and have been developing strategies for rendering its true nature. This pursuit has by default shown as flashes of the underlying perceptual structure to vision. Van Gogh's patterning of space is not accidental or decorative. In the same way Cezanne is not painting leaves of the tree, he's articulating a spatial value at the point where a cluster of them occupies space with respect to his chosen fixation. In the same way in this large painting I'm indicating proximity from fixation by size of brush stroke. Stand in front of this painting while looking at yourself and the painting in a mirror and the sense of immersion is quite extraordinary. The experience is akin to standing in a cave simulator. The proposition is that this field potential is the end product of the visual system propagating a second order data set about the real setting embedded in the light array. We would have to consider this dark light giving rise to dark noise in the visual system from which proximity cues can be realized as part of an holistic spatial impression of the scene. A list of the key scientists who have encountered these properties as part of their investigations into retinal receptor firing thresholds is given at the end. Rendering this second order signal requires a complete rethink about how to approach the canvas and the painting process. Vision space theory suggests that the phenomenon is generated according to the perceptual structure of the perceiving organism, vision being closer to a controlled hallucination than it is the result of processes akin to optical projection. We generate a field structure into which visual cues emerge from an all possibilities potential. Needless to say, we will not be painting the canvas white, setting out the geometry of central perspective and colouring that in. We don't even want to play the edges of the canvas into consideration, as there are no picture frames or planes within phenomenal field. Distribution within the field appears to be self-similar or fractal in nature. I think this is how a canvas attempting to render phenomenal field should be primed. Into the field will appear the cues specific to the scene. The field is always the same, fixation in the centre. It's what appears within it that changes. I then have to soften this in a way that will not leave any impression of the tool being used. A big brush, for example. This is a photograph of the still life setting. The angle's not quite right, but it's near enough. I can now plot the scene within the field. This just gives some orientation, a grid reference system really, as I start to account for the cues that are isolated and selected as marks to make within the field. First thing is to establish the weight of the brush strokes to be used to indicate proximity. Fine in the center at point zero, then increasing with distance from fixation in x, y and z directions. No attempt is made to render form outside the fixation area. We are primarily establishing locations in space. A location value indicated by the size of brush stroke only has meaning in context to the whole. We are rendering implicit holistic space. If you approach an area of the field with a reductionist view, i.e. to pin down the value in isolation, it has no independent meaning. We now start to see the introduction of a second tier of brush strokes. These brush strokes appear in patches the same size as the original tier, i.e. they have a group identity. They also form part of a local reference parameter. That local reference parameter is still valid within the first tier, but now it can be subdivided. Notice that these marks all point to the fixation area. Subdivision within the second tier allows for different individual brushstrokes to be assigned different colours. This provides the potential for greater detail to be referenced within the field, for example the round coloured box. Also notice the potential to group marks belonging to a surface, for example the left hand side of the tabletop. When the fixation is held on the sculpted hands, the groups form and we perceive the tabletop falling away into the distance. 
Now notice how the brush strokes on the backboard behind the object starts to resemble those in paintings by Cezanne. I'm not setting out to accomplish this, I'm merely rendering the system. Neither is it a coincidence we are recording the same things. Also notice the large brush strokes on the right hand side. These indicate the position of a couch, side table and end wall. At this point in peripheral vision, object definition has all been but lost. But the vital spatial proximity cues can still be registered with the size of brush stroke. We are also depicting the far distance out into the garden beyond the outer walls of the studio. Very substantial brush strokes that fall into place when the fixation is adhered to. Other objects on the table can now be referenced within the space, together with the arm of the angle poise. In some areas, a third tier of brush strokes can be made out, providing further clarification. We don't see these textures in vision because we can't look at them. We can't be objective about them and we can't address them objectively. We can, however, experience them subjectively and intuitively develop systems of marks that provide the missing data or dark data. Finally, in terms of the painting's development, we can attend to the fixation point and its immediate area of macular or central vision. We can finally be explicit here and address the form of the objects and their surfaces. While this is still a painting in progress, the essential duality of data sets articulating the fundamentals of the two takes on reality available to us have been established. The point is, we need both the implicit context together with the explicit contemplation of form to model visual awareness and hence our relationship with the real. The reality is, we have to fabricate our visual reality. It's a composite. We have to do this because light's the messenger, a free-moving microparticle that decoheres at the retina with two possible stories to impart. If you look at this painting in a mirror, like other vision space paintings, it becomes noticeably more salient and more immersive. I struggle not to use the word 3D, it's actually EXPD. The painting establishes important cues commensurate with those making up experiential visual saliency. Binocular fusion technologies and conventional 3D systems have nothing to do with visual saliency. But why should the mirror have this effect? I would suggest that it's related to the fact that the mirror is, in the real setting, just a flat object. The disorder field contained in the light array establishes that for us. After all, that's its purpose. Thus the reflection of the real setting has some spatial saliency stripped out of it by the mirror. The mirror is acting on the information. It's not passive. However, the depiction of the real setting in the painting does have the full spatial structure hardwired into it. So when we look at the painting in the mirror together with the rest of the scene, it's only the depiction in the painting that stands out as being experientially true or complete. It looks more spatially salient than the reflected, real setting in which it sits. Has the longest-running psychophysical experimentation in history with respect to vision space already been conducted? Does every national gallery, if not serious regional art gallery, require a work by Turner, Cezanne, Degas, Van Gogh, Bonnar? Why is it that millions of people travel all over the globe to see these arrangements of everyday objects? How much are these paintings worth? You won't read much about them in vision science books, even if they appear on their front covers. There are, of course, very significant implications if this vision space theory is correct. It would mean that we are taking more out of the light array than our current photographic instrumentation was designed to detect, however powerful the optics. Personally, I don't find this at all difficult to believe. We are receiving a dark data set and processing it. This simply means that we have not formally discovered it yet in science. The instrumentation that functions like the eye and the brain is not available to us. Artists have been working with these concerns for centuries because they are using that facility. I have this argument with scientists on a repeated basis. For science, something is not known until a paper has been published that defines it and someone else has repeated the experimentation, until it is statistically valid. While the defining experiment is going to take an entirely new approach to experimentation and new technology, an approach to the nature of reality that formally acknowledges the embedded nature of the human condition in the universe. Current experimentation that works at this level, in the form of still life painting, is not deemed to be knowledge at all, just subjective play. Could the dark data set and the way we handle it lead us to approaches to reality that open up onto other dark data we think is out there? Another presentation on this will follow.
In modeling visual awareness, we are starting to learn something fundamental with respect to how to be objective at all scales. What's actually involved in us being objective? 